Again, hello and good morning. My name is Groom Dinkna. I'm responsible for corporate membership here at the Institute for Experiential AI. It is my honor to welcome you all here in the room and to the many of you online to our second annual business conference this year titled Leading with AI Responsibly. Today, here at the Eastern Village's 17th floor at Northeastern University, we have a packed an amazing and an amazing agenda filled with America's most innovative business and thought leaders who will share with us how they are applying AI responsibly across their organizations with transformative results. I'll be your navigator today as we delve into these timely and critical topics and answer questions from our audience, both here in the room and those of you joining us virtually. At the Institute of Experiential AI, I get to work with some exceptional, talented, and experienced people, including our first two speakers. Usama Fiyad, Executive Director for the Institute of Experiential AI and Professor of the Practice at Corey College of Computer Sciences, and Jansu Janja, Director of Responsible AI Practice at the Institute for Experiential AI and Research Associate Professor in Philosophy at Northeastern University, I welcome them both to the stage. Um, welcome, welcome everyone, good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us both in the room and online. Uh, this is our, our second conference. Our first one was in April 2022, which was kind of the inaugural event for the Institute for Experiential AI. Uh, this one, this conference today, is kind of a continuation of that vision we originally set, which is it's important in order to advance AI research, in order to advance relevant knowledge in AI, we need to focus on working on addressing some real world challenges. And the choice we made was to go after the challenges by partnering with the companies and the organizations who actually have those challenges and who have that data. Uh, this explains kind of why in the past 15 years, most of the kind of real engineering developments, uh, most of the interesting developments in AI and making it work have actually taken place in companies rather than in academia. Um, and that's because, not for lack of desire, but that's because the companies had all the data, they had all the problems, they had the motivation to go after them. So we think it is up to academia to reach out and figure out ways to work with businesses, with companies, with organizations on saying, let's find and identify these kind of real world challenges go after them and use that as the catalyst for advancing our knowledge, our research. And because this is Northeastern, our teaching methodology, which is highly experiential with a huge emphasis on kind of seeing how it works in the real world and, and, and so forth. Um, so today, um, I'll ask Jansu to kind of uh, join and hammer on the themes uh, that are important. Uh, to me, one important theme is the partnership with, with you all and the ability to help you co-work towards solutions to figure out kind of in these confusing times, what do you do? Um, to further confuse you this morning, uh, our opening keynote was supposed to be with Dan Rosenzweig, CEO of Czech, which I, who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, but of course, Dan being Dan said, oh, why don't we turn it into a fireside chat? And you ask me the tough questions. So we'll, we'll try to do a mix. We'll have him share a few slides and then we'll, we'll turn it over uh, to that discussion. Uh, but today is, is a full day. We have several keynotes. We have several panel, panels. We do have a couple of uh, fireside chats, all designed to address different aspects of AI, what it means for business, etc. under the big theme of responsible AI. And on that note, I'll invite uh, Jansu to say a few words because yesterday we actually held a workshop, 
technical workshop focused primarily on responsible AI and, and how to reduce it, how to properly reduce it into practice. So, John Su. Thank you, Sama. Thank you, everyone. So I will repeat one of the things that you said, that the importance of having industry and academia together is, um, I don't think we can stress this enough, because what we have been experiencing in, I'm a philosopher, so I'm an ethicist, I work on AI ethics, and the frustration for us was, if you can find a little uh, group to work on AI ethics in academia, industry is not interested. If there's a, there are developers in the industry who actually want this, you cannot find academics interested. So there has been this big disconnect be between academia and industry. And it's not very unusual for this to happen. So this is just another, responsible AI is just another um, aspect where this became the case. What we have been doing, what we have been trying to do in the institute is really bridge this gap. And we are lucky because um, in the institute is very industry facing. So we have industry partners that bring us their problems, that brings us their questions, concerns. And we have the vast knowledge of academics, of the size of University Northeastern is with all of these different departments to find solutions for these questions. Um, the practice, so I'm the director of responsible AI practice. Practice does not work by itself. It has to have research embedded. A lot of the questions that we are facing, we don't know the answers of. So we are constantly doing research as we are working on the practice aspect. What we are trying to do is to provide ethics. And what we are trying to do, to do is embed ethics into the innovation process in such a way that it is uh, efficient, it is comprehensive, it is robust. We are what we are trying not to do is to have this um, ethics policing structure where there's an approval structure and everything goes through a bottleneck or the innovation just slows down extremely. We are working on AI because we know AI has great pot potential to benefit society, benefit humanity, benefit the world. And we want to make sure that we get those benefits without um, turning, the, turning it the other side and getting ourselves into a situation where we create even un more unfair societies, even more harm to individuals, even more harm to the environment. Um, so yesterday, uh, on that note, yesterday, we did have a workshop, all-day workshop, uh, with about 50 experts uh, from academia, from uh, industry, uh, from different disciplines. We cannot do responsible AI without having a multidisciplinary perspective. Ethics, philosophy is at the core of it, AI is at the core of it, computer science, but we need to design these systems. We need to uh, understand the social impact working with social scientists. So what we tried to do was to bring together this expertise into one room and make progress on two accounts. One is um, how can we create responsible AI frameworks, responsible AI practices that are at least reliably, we can say, if these, are, these elements are there, then this is a good response to our practice. There will always be different frameworks. We have our own. Uh, but we want to make sure that there is a standard of what is a, what is a good basic response to our framework, what is a good response to AI workflow. And the other question was about research. What are the priorities for, uh, what are the priorities, what are the gaps in research right now for responsible AI? Um, and that, there is a self-serving aspect of this because in the institute we, we offer with, to the industry um, these practices. So we work with the industry to um, analyze the AI systems that they are using or that they are about to use. Um, we work with them to put in place organizational structures where they have guidelines to um, analyze, uh, ethically analyze, do technical audits of their models, of their systems. Um, where they have accountability process, where they have a workflow process, again, that, is, that integrates ethics seamlessly. And we also work with the industry to um, train the, the different, train for different roles. We are not trying to turn everyone into an ethicist, that would be a terrible idea, but we want everyone to have some um, awareness, some understanding of ethics, and we want to create the, within the organization a certain level of um, sort of like chain of interaction where everyone can flag an important ethical concern and then they can figure out the guidelines, they can reach out to the experts within the organization. So I think with that I should stop because we do have a very full program. Yes. 
Thank you for everyone for coming. Thank, thank you, Jansu. Um, so it's my great pleasure right now, truly from my heart, uh, to introduce, uh, honestly, a very impressive business leader. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with, with uh, Dan Rosenzweig when I was at Yahoo. Uh, they acquired my little company, and uh, they jokingly named me chief data officer. And I remember like, people around the room laughing, saying, you know, what should we call you? And uh, Dan said, oh, chief data officer sounds funny. And everybody around the, the table laughed. Uh, but the world took it seriously, I guess. Um, more, more importantly, uh, Dan has been through these uh, amazing transformations. Uh, and we'll talk about that in our, in our fireside chat of wave after wave of big change, whether it's in publishing as we moved into the internet, the internet as we moved into a world of search. Uh, after serving as CEO at, at Yahoo and then running Guitar Hero for a while, he joined Chegg, uh, which at the time was about kind of renting books back then to, to students rather than having students buy them. And he had to also ride that wave of changing their model. And one of the big reasons I wanted to invite him to come talk to us today is, you know, all of you by now have heard about generative AI and chat GPT. Uh, all of you are probably part of the fascinated crowd that are saying, you know, how could these you know, stochastic parrots do these amazing things? Um, but probably none of you has been even close to a position where your business suddenly completely changes because of this technology. And then I figured, hey, having Dan here to tell us, well, how would you react to this kind of complete change? What do you do? And how do you adapt as a company? What lessons do you learn from it? Would be a, a, a very useful uh, exercise for all of us as we think about uh, the, the impact of generative AI on our society. By the way, I'll also add, Dan is on the board of Adobe. Uh, Adobe happens to be one of the companies I most admire today. You know, I have that list changing over time. But I really admire the way they embraced generative AI and embedded it into their Firefly product in a natural way on a platform that kind of enables any user to use it without even knowing they're using it. But at the same time, they took care of some of the really thorny issues, like indemnifying any users from any IP rights because they built their own model and trained it on their own collection, uh, their own image library, and said, if you run into an IP problem here, it's our problem, it's not your problem, which is amazing. I mean, that's, that's about thinking about, about. And by the way, not surprisingly, Dan was likely kind of one of the first few phone calls to Shantanu uh, Narayan, who's, who's the CEO of Adobe, uh, being on his board saying, hey, you got to jump on this. Uh, because he was in the middle of discussions with Sam Altman and with several others around kind of this technology and what it means, et cetera. So with that, please uh, join me in, in welcoming Dan, uh, who has chosen to change the format last minute into He'll share with us a few slides for context, and then we'll go into a fireside chat. Dan. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Oh, here. <clears throat> I would just like to say, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Second of all, um, I'm not known for very many things, but being the poster child for having your stock drop 48% in five minutes uh, after talking about ChatGPT on your earnings call is not the one I was hoping for. So here we are. <laughs> uh, I had the pleasure of working with Osama um, at Yahoo. Um, it's nice to say working with, um, we, we all pretty much worked for him. Um, and the original title was Data Dude, if you remember. And then um, we moved it to Chief Data Officer because um, whatever Yahoo did wrong, we did a lot of things right. 
um, and one of them was we really were the first cloud company. We really were the first communications company. It's just a lot of the things we did, we did early because none of the things were invented yet, so the people at Yahoo had to build it themselves. So remember, there was Yahoo Messenger before there was Slack. Um, there was, you know, there was Yahoo Mail before there was Gmail. And, and um, so as Osama points out, I have been both the windshield, or been in positions that have been both the windshield and the bug when it comes to technology. Um, and we're in one of those moments again today. So thank you for inviting me, sir. Sure. So uh, maybe to get started, I don't know whether we have some slides from Dan that we want to It's just the first two yeah. if we have them. Yep. Um, so this is research that we have yet to publish. Um, so you're seeing it first. Some of it will look very obvious to you, which is what Chegg does is we serve college students. We put the student first. And the transition we made was from renting textbooks, which was to help lower the cost of college um, to students because it's, it, we always saw it as extremely unfortunate and unnecessary and we have uh, pretty substantial views on that. Um, but then we switched as we realized two things, the business model was gonna go away. Anybody with a brain would think print should go away after a while. Um, and e-textbooks was a commodity business and Wall Street hated it and our stock dropped to three bucks and Amazon launched literally on our first earnings call. And, and um, so I'm actually 24, but this is what happens when all this stuff coming at you. Uh, but uh, the last time when Osama and I worked together, the, re the, the big change that brought us together was the internet itself. But the second one was, I think I came out in 2003 and made a statement, which I wasn't even sure I knew what it meant, which was people are gonna want what they want, when they want it, where they want it, how they want it, and on the device they want it. And that was before there was an iPhone. It really was the Blackberry days and there was no consumer mobile. And we were way ahead on putting it onto multiple screens because we understood multiple screens, multiple surfaces. We didn't know the words back then. We didn't know the words cloud back then. Um, but this is the first really technical change that I've seen since then, since mobile, that is gonna affect everybody, good, bad, or ugly. Uh, and so as the, as the people that actually educate more students than anybody else in the world, and particularly in the United States, we have on the course of a year, 8 million paying customers and 30 million people a month come to our services and um, that we think it's important to track what students are doing with AI. So this is just, you can see the popularity of ChatGPT amongst this constituency. Uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody. And as Osama pointed out, when I was publisher of PC Magazine back in the day, um, one of the reasons that I was able to make a, a transition from print to internet, and most people weren't, were the first people to go online were the computer magazine readers. So I've seen this movie before. The first people that are gonna be using new technology to their advantage are gonna be students and young people. And so they're really gonna dictate the ethics and the responsibility and the morals and the usage. So this is just an interesting stat to see how close Chegg is to the most prominent users. We probably should go to the next one. Next slide, please. And this is how they're using it. So you can see that they use it all the time for anything. They just ask it stuff. Some of that is actually due to loneliness, believe it or not. Some of that is to do with idea iteration and generation. Um, most of it, because ChatGPT, this is not the Dolly version of it, but ChatGPT, most of this you'll see is about what you all use it for, which is writing which is where most of the trouble with academic integrity seems to be getting into, something that Chegg does not do. We don't do writing for students. We help students learn how to write, but we don't do writing. But you can see, but they're using it for everything, including cooking tips and, and work. So it has become the fastest, what is it, the fastest 100 million user product ever, and it's ingrained in day-to-day -day life. So we just wanted to give you an idea of how it's being used um, because People haven't even invented uses for it yet. Remember, it's only a year ago that it came out. That's how quickly this has happened. So speed is everything. Let's go to the next one. And this is what they hope for it. So it's not just for schoolwork. You can see it's very helpful in everyday situations. 
they are searching for answers and they are trying, they used Google for their initial set of answers and now they're looking for something more conversational, more relevant to them, more speaks to them in their language. Um, and Google never got there, right? And we never got there with Siri. Um, so a lot of people had technology and missed it. So whatever, you know, you think they may be moving too fast and why are they putting voice and why are they doing all these things? It's because look at this. All right, let's just, we'll probably show just another slide or two in Osama, then let's just jump in. Okay, you can, this is just the part for, for Chegg itself, obviously. Um, and, and if I can make a couple of points today, one of them is this. We talk about the ethical dilemma. Um, if you ask us from the perspective of the company that teaches more students or provides tools to more students than anybody um, in the US and helps them learn and master their subjects and matriculate and graduate better and faster and get jobs and what we're gonna be building over time, um, the most important thing is that this is a technology that has the opportunity to become the most powerful learning tool and expression tool that has ever been created. It is not yet, but it could become that. And so rather than find ways to be upset with it, rather than find ways to ban it, rather than find ways to use how the bad actors are using it, what we really should be thinking about is if you gave this to every kid in kindergarten or first grade, regardless of their background, their gender, their race, their language, and you gave everybody the same set of this most powerful learning and expression tool ever created, could we finally break through the structural barriers? So what Chegg is looking to do is, is level the playing field by putting the tool in everybody's hands, responsibly, ethically, morally, financially, to the point where you ought to be able to win based on who you are and how hard you work, not where you were born. Um, and that could be probably the most important moral question of the day, which is let's not find ways to stop, let's find ways to empower. And that's not gonna be easy, by the way, because a lot of people's cheese are gonna be moved during the process. So, okay, so maybe you wanna jump into your stuff. We, we don't have to show more unless you guys wanna see more. Hopefully this was helpful for you to just get a sense of what's going on in the, in the world of the mind of the student. Right, so the, the title of this session was What If, suggested yes. by. Um, maybe, maybe we'll start, Dan, with, with a tough question, which is, and I know you're a public company, so you have to be careful about what you say. And I have earnings in two weeks, so yes. I'm definitely gonna say <laughs> nothing about that. Uh, but when, when faced with such a, maybe explain to the audience for a second because some of them don't even appreciate the impact that ChatGPT getting out there, becoming popular very quickly had on your new transformed business, right? As you went from helping students rent textbooks instead of paying overpriced prices to buy them uh, into kind of helping them find exercises and homeworks and, and, and so forth to prepare for exams. Maybe give the audience a feel for how much of a shock this was when suddenly students started turning to chat GPT. Yeah, um, thank you for bringing back that wonderful memory. <laughs> um, so look, it, when you do anything in life, um, there's going to be good days, there's going to be bad days, there's going to be a lot of confusion, especially when new things are invented, and there's going to be a lot of talk, and there's going to be a lot of momentum, and there's going to be a lot of hype. Um, fortunately, where we are now is the hype is being replaced by the realities. And the realities are, it's good at some things, it's not good at everything, and thank goodness for Chegg, it's not good at what we do. The assumption was it would be good at what we do. And the assumption was that it would, students would use it first. That assumption is correct. So <clears throat> for us, the first thing when you're a company faced with instant, unexpected technological change is not to panic, but rather let some time go by, observe, learn the facts, 
And, but when you work in a world where people make instant decisions, especially when it comes to money, you have to recognize that the consequence of telling the truth um, may not serve you in the short term. But what we're building is for the long term. And what we're building, we think, is going to be massive. It's going to be bigger than what we've done before. And we think that we, we have the, the data, the talent, the vision. We have the capital resources to do it. Um, but people don't want to hear that on day one. right? They don't want to hear that you have to make a change because it's something new. And so <clears throat> there's a lot that goes into that. And as you pointed out, um, I had the good fortune of knowing Sam Altman. I met him when he was 19. Um, of all the crazy meetings, I went at the end of January and sat with him and, and Ashton Kutcher for two and a half hours to talk about what Chappie GPT really was, what FOR was going to be, where they were going, how we thought about education, what their challenges were. Um, and leaving that meeting, two things became clear. One, we had what they craved, and they're not going to have it, and we do. And that's good. Um, and second, there's no time to waste. And I, I made two phone calls, as you point out. I called our guys, and I said, OK, everybody's getting together. We are literally going to rip the product down to its roots, and we're going to reinvent it on the fly, because the capabilities of matching our data set, which is over 100 million step-by-step -step solutions, our learning taxonomy that had been built over 10 years, our trust that we have with students on accuracy. These are the things that they don't have and will never have, our ability to personalize and build new things. The ability to take 100% of what they do and build something new on top of 100% of what we do. Time is of the essence. And we may not get it right, but we can't wait. We can't second guess the decision to move quickly. And we did. And the second call was to Adobe to say, look, you know, based on um, PDF and based on um, what we're doing with images and what they're doing with Dolly, um, it's a conversation that you want to have also. And of course, a uh, Adobe is so far out ahead of everybody in terms of the science, the technology, the ethics, the morals. They their leadership is impeccable in terms of their desire to get it right. Um, that, um, but both companies understood. And they came out with Firefly in 90 days. Think about that. Three billion images have already been created in Firefly in 90 days. So what we know is the ability to use these tools to go faster exists. What we know is that we have to. What we don't know is how much is it going to cost? <laughs> or, or what's it going to do well? Or what's a hallucination? Or like, um, and so from the Chegg perspective, the choice we made was to embrace it and to recognize we had assets that no one else in the world had that will advantage us to build the most personalized learning experience ever, and that we were going to do it. And we weren't going to look back, and we weren't going to worry about anything else that we had done before or anything else that we wanted to believe in. Like, we were betting on the inevitable. And I think that's the stage where most companies have to get to now. So in, in, this, in this landscape where things are moving fast, and we'll get to fast in the next question, but there's a cacophony of noises. Everybody's kind of making assumptions about what this new generative AI can do and how powerful it is and how amazing it is and all of that. What gives you hope, speaking from the Chegg perspective, mm. what is it that you see that says, wait a second, we don't need to be as scared as a lot of investors and people were in the beginning. And there is hope here. And here's how we add value. Yeah, first of all, obviously great question. And we're not scared. In fact, we're enthusiastic. Uh, and again, I'll remind you, it's only been 11 months. So what's happened in 11 months? The hype is dying down. The facts are coming out. Um, what do you need? You need access to the technology. You need uh, a capital for GPUs. You need um, a vision that you want to go to. And um, the thing that I don't think people really understood was you need a clean, accurate, relevant data set. That the question over bias or not bias is always going to be bias when you have humans. Wherever you are in the world, cultures think differently about the same set of data. But when it comes to learning, and it comes to education, and it comes to STEM, right is right. And theirs isn't, and may not be. And recognizing that breaking down what a question is and how people learn 
and what are the right steps and the multimodalities, but the ability to marry 100% of what they do, which is really the conversational nature of definitions and understanding, along with truly learning pedagogy of how individuals learn math or how they learn accounting. These are things that we have built over 13 years of this data set. And so once we appreciated, and I think once investors appreciate, it's the marriage of the technology of what they have, the experience of what we have, but the data set of what we have that makes us the moat and not them. In fact, in many cases, ChatGPT4 for got worse in the things that they do. And if you look at the research, students know it quickly. The fear was that we didn't know what they were capable of. But the first set of data that we looked at showed that pretty much 95% of what we did, they didn't do. And that 50% of where we had overlap, they didn't do it well. And it hasn't gotten better. So accuracy isn't going to be the key forever. It's going to be the actual user experience. My view, and yours hopefully coming from Yahoo, is that over time, generalists don't win out over verticals. Because verticals spend every second of every day understanding the needs of that user in that moment. It's the personalization that they'll never be able to do in every single thing that you do. They may know things about you, but they're not going to know exactly where you are. Chegg will have the ability or has the ability to know who you are, what school you go to, what class you're in, who's your professor, the questions that professor has asked over time, likely the major that you're in, where therefore the job you're likely to get. So we're going to be able to go from academic support to skills-based analysis. We're going to be able to assess you and say, based on what work you're doing on us, we can tell you what you're proficient in and what you're not. Would you like to become more proficient in it? Because students that go to Northeastern who take this major generally work for these 10 companies. They get paid this, and they need to know these skills, and you're a 5 out of 10. We'll be able to do all that. They will never be able to do all that. So the ability for Chegg to do more things other than just academic support, skill support, will also be able to understand, are you getting your sleep? Do you need meditation? Do you need exercise? Do you need to be connected to mental health? We are going to become this day-to-day -day tool in your pocket that we've, we've always dreamed of being able to do, but we've never been able to. But this technology married with what we have allows us to do it. So we're not only not scared, we're actually fired up. The energy at the company, um, and you know, because thank goodness you were willing to talk to our board, um, uh, is so high about being able to help people everywhere in the world, no matter what language you're at, no matter what level you're at, no matter how you learn. Some people learn through video. Some people learn through discussion. Some people learn through cramming. Some people learn through planning. We'll be able to do all of those things for students and no one else in the world will be able to, so it's exciting. So I'll go faster. Maybe, maybe <laughs> one more question, and then I also want to get questions from the audience. I'm sure the audience has questions. So I am, one of the things that amazes me, and I'm usually not amazed by much, uh, is how fast the field is moving. Yeah. In terms of, you know, you think for a second, OK, here's how we, we could use ChatGPT, or here's how generative AI could address this topic. And suddenly, something else comes out that kind of completely flips it or shows a whole new use or whatever. I can only imagine from your viewpoint, as you kind of make these decisions, you know, how, how do you react to this super fast changing environment where it's like boiling up with, with new angles almost every day, or if not every week? Yeah, and from every angle, right? I mean, that, that's the most interesting thing. So let me just give you an example of something that probably none of you ever thought of, but we have to think of it very seriously. Not, not, it's not an ethical or moral dilemma. But people learn differently. So language was the easiest thing. But then there's cultures. And there's cues in cultures that people learn. So for example, you'll be able to on Chegg, talk to Chegg and say, teach me quantum physics, but do it in the language of NWA, which is a band uh, you know, a rap band from Los Angeles in the 80s. Because there might be people who can't understand this analogy, but will understand that analogy. 
So the ability to talk to it, but also the ability to make it culturally relevant on an individualized basis. This thing only came out 11 months ago. And we're already there, like with those kinds of tools. So what we have to do is do a couple of things, because we have to live inside the semesters of school. right? So the first thing we have to do is provide what students come to us for, which is accuracy, clarity, help, reduce your stress, um, and help you get to the understanding something at a level that you can master it. But the way we do it is going to have to change. So it's a lot like when Adobe went to the cloud. Like Adobe used to come out with package software every two years and update it every two years. And so their scientists would be great. We don't have to do anything for two years. right? <coughs> now you're in the cloud. You have to do everything every two seconds. So if you go to Chegg today, some of the tools we're rolling out now, which is the ability to say, look, do you want a practice quiz? And do you want us to put it in flashcards for you? Yesterday, we didn't have it. Today, we might. So we, it's a 24-7 scenario where the tools and the data have to be tuned every second of every day. And that is a whole new work style that people are going to have to get used to. Um, and it's, and it's going to be fascinating. But the passion to help students learn is what's driving the energy right now. So uh, what you have to recognize is the definition of speed has changed. Every second of every day, you must update what you're doing, because your data must be accurate. Your user experience must be relevant. Your personalization must be right. There isn't six months chunks of saying, well, wait six months to fix it. There is no fixing it. You, I'm waiting six months to fix it. There's only fixing it now. So the speed in which we correct data on our site is now in less than an hour, because it has to be. And that was not something we did before. Yep. So while we wait for the first question to pop up, I'll give you a chance. Please raise your hand if you have questions uh, while the microphone is making its way to the first question. Yes. Maybe you can kind of part with us with some, what, what would you like the audience to keep in mind and remember from this little chat? Well, two things. One, the need that this is real. So Chegg never got bought into the Bitcoin, the NFT, all that kind of nonsense. Uh, it's not that those things may or may not have a place, but they're not transformational changes. They're literally just gambling in a lot of ways, money laundering in some ways. Um, but that this is a tool of which computers are going to learn from computers. And there's two things I know to be true. One, we have no idea where it's going to go, literally no idea. We have no idea when the next breakthrough is going to happen or what that breakthrough is going to do. And two, the what if came from this. It's what I was saying earlier. What if you actually change the dialogue in education from we don't want kids using this to cheat, which we don't. Let's be clear, we don't. To isn't it our moral imperative to make sure that everybody in the world knows how to use a tool that may change the world? Right? When you think about what it's going to do in pharma, or what it's going to do in the negative sides of war and other things, that data is at the core of everything, and accurate data is at the core of everything, and there's going to be ethical issues around privacy and moral issues over who gets to use it and who gets to control it and who makes decisions. There's going to be all sorts of questions, but at the end of the day, don't we have an obligation to empower the individual to use it to their advantage in life so we can break down some of the structural obstacles that have never been solved? Um, through all policies that we have, and, and that's important to Chegg. So we uh, see a lot of questions over here. Yeah, so we have our first question, second question. There's a third one brewing, too. Oh, go ahead, we're please. brewing. Yeah, Who's um, going first? Hi, hi, Dan. Thanks a lot for the talk. It was uh, very interesting. One of the examples that you gave I found very interesting was the idea of teaching quantum physics with NWA. Yeah. Uh, very that came from Will I Am, by the way. He showed me that. So um, you know, I, I, he had the feeling. Nice. So uh, along that same route, I guess one of my questions is kind of based on standardized tests here in the USA. Yeah. So typically, one of the problems that we had in the past with standardized tests, such as SAT, GRE, and so forth, where they, they weren't really in a language that someone maybe from different uh, background might have understood. Uh, do you guys at Chegg uh, maybe plan on uh, seeing that as a target of some sort? 
That's a great question. So the issue over standardized tests is a very politically hot issue, which my team would say, Dan, please do not weigh in as they watch from California at 630 in the morning. Too bad, team. Um, I think I'm going to reframe it as to how are we going to assess people. Look, whether professors want to hear this or not, or parents want to hear this or not, 88% of all students in this country go to school for one purpose, which is to get a better job. So if we don't make students employable, what's the point? So not uniquely employable without the academics, but it's the connection of the two. Um, so assessment is going to be essential. So Chegg is building a series of assessments for the student themselves, not for any institution. So the student can assess. So for example, we'll be maybe one of the only places that can tell you how are you doing versus other kids in your class at mastering this particular part of the question, not necessarily the whole question. Or if you're in uh, finance, here's how well you're effectively using spreadsheets uh, versus people who are taking the same class across America or across the world. So we'll be able to rank you if you want to see it. We'll be able to assess you if you want to see it. And then we'll be able to skill you if you want to see it. So the, the, the point that we're taking is the student is the only person in the equation that we want to focus on. Because everybody else has a different agenda. The administration might have a different agenda. The researchers might have a different agenda. The professor might have a different agenda. But at the end of the day, the student's the paying customer. And it's their life. So they're coming here to learn. They're coming here to get skilled up, and they're coming here to become better citizens, hopefully, and employable. And so I don't know that we'll fix the standardized test. What I do know is we will assess you versus your peers who are looking to do the same thing you are. And once that's revealed to you, hopefully you'll get to do something about it because we'll provide it for you. Does that make sense? So we're running out of time. No, so this is so much fun. Quick question. I don't usually get up this early. This is great. <laughs> quick questions. And quick answers. OK. Dan. <laughs> All right, so quick question. Good morning, Shazab here, Dan. Thank you for the insights. As you look at the phenomenon of the open talent economy, uh, what are companies doing as far as um, skilling, reskilling, uh, leveraging chat GTP? What are some use cases and examples that you're seeing? I'll give you two quick ones that Chegg is doing. I can't speak for everybody. But for example, well, one of the great things is inside the products themselves, they can now teach you how to use the product. We could never do that before. So you can actually embed it right inside Adobe's products. You can ask Adobe. That's something that Photoshop's never been able to do before. That's going to be a huge advantage. But for example, to your point, we work, Chegg has a skills division that most of you don't know about, which is growing very rapidly. We help frontline workers. We help other workers. And we, do, we build bespoke skills classes for companies. And we're building AI into it so you can ask AI the question. The most important issue for people is when they get stuck, they quit. So Chegg has always been about getting you unstuck. So we're working with Indeed right now, so they didn't have to let people go. We're reskilling them completely for the future. We're working through Guild with Walmart, and we're going to be starting teaching Walmart employees how to use AI. We're going to start doing that for uh, professors, teach them how to teach people how to use AI. So that's a big deal. That was quick. Excellent. Okay. Last last question, please. Yeah, th th Dan, I wanted to. Yes, it was. We can hear you. It is on Dan. I wanted to uh, follow up on your comment that the student is the paying customer. And uh, you know, they're looking for education to get a good paying job. And uh, the question, two questions is, how do you see um, AI and being responsible, right? How do you see it affecting um, a college degree? For example, could the speed in which somebody learns go from maybe four years to two years so they can get a degree in two years? That's question number one. And question number two, when they're out in the workforce and they're getting retrained, like you're talking about with Walmart, how do you see AI uh, playing a role in terms of like retraining individuals to be in a, uh, the new economy? Yeah, both in a very big way. Terrific question. So first of all, Chegg has always asked the question, if you can binge a series, why can't you binge your education? Um, like the, 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 the moniker of four years or two years is completely artificial. 95% of a student's time on campus is not in a classroom. That's a choice that somebody made. It's not re a requirement. It's not that students take that many classes over that many years. Unfortunately, most students don't graduate ever, let alone in, in four years. 
you, you might be interesting to know that 60% of students don't go on to college and 40% of those do never get a degree and 85% of those that go to community colleges never get a degree and the average age of a student in this country is now 25 and many of them have children. So the answer should be don't we have a moral and an ethical obligation and it's also a good business decision to accelerate what you can learn, the ways you can learn it, in person, online, hybrid, all of them and AI ought to be able to help you learn it faster but here's an interesting fact just about course creation. So when we used to create a skill, it used to take 18 weeks and, and any place from $200,000 to $900,000 to build one. Now it takes five weeks and $40,000 because of AI. So the ability to build more curriculum and have that curriculum be more personalized, more relevant, has accelerated dramatically. So we would love to see, you probably didn't know that the largest school in this country, non-for-profit school, is actually an online school. It's Southern New Hampshire University that teaches over 180,000 students a year. And so the ability to teach students the way they learn best in a world where they don't have to sacrifice a job or parenting, but can also learn, but could also get the benefit of in-person, um, all those things should be an obligation for us to do. It's also a really good business decision for universities. All right. Uh, why can't you binge an education? What, what a way to... Uh I remember that one for a long time. <laughs> when, when I used to uh, attend Dan's weekly staff meetings, which I reported elsewhere in the company, but he insisted on having me in those great meetings, and people would come together, and everybody's panicked. And Dan would always start by saying, calm down. I don't know about you guys, but I sleep like a baby. I wake up every two hours crying my eyes out. <laughs> so, <laughs> that has so, not changed, but now <laughs> I also need to go to the restroom. But <laughs> on, on that note, uh, please join me in thanking Dan for a Thank very, Thank you, everybody, very for, for coming. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Dan.